you have them at your fingertips and you can always refer to them and reach out to them because uh, LinkedIn, you can do messaging and whatnot through there. So it's always been a great platform. So um, our educational speaker, I know John usually introduces. Uh, we have a couple other people who are part of the leadership committee who haven't been attending regularly. And I don't know if there's a conflict, but uh, we are really excited today. So I'll have John introduce our fabulous speaker from FAU, Go Owls, because I just graduated with my master's degree. So back in December, so Go Owls. I love the virtual background, Dr. George. Thank you, Barbara. Barbara just loves to have me read first thing in the morning because I'm so good at it. Dr. George has earned her PhD and MSN degree from Emory University and completed her postdoctoral fellowship at Duke University in Religion and Health. She previously served as faculty in residence at both the University of Alabama and Emory University, where she led the Bridging the Academic Services and Ethics Program. Her primary research area aims to promote the health and holistic well-being of individuals with or at risk for HIV AIDS through evidence-based psychosocial interventions focused on social determinants of health. That's a mouthful. Her research has previously been funded by the National Institutes of Health, including the National Institutes of Nursing Research, the Georgia Department of Community Health, the John Templeton Foundation, Emory University Religion and Public Health Collaborative, the Biomedical Imaging Technology Center, and the University of Alabama. Her work is currently funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Foundation HRSA V, small i, small i, V, Healthcare Southern Initiative Pro, Pro blah, blah, blah. V, small i, small i, V, Healthcare Solution Initiative Positive Action Program and the NIH Founded Resource Center of Minority Aging Research, RCMAR. Dr. George's research, research productivity demonstrates the quality as well as the quantity of her work and also signals her national reputation in the areas of holistic health, spirituality, and HIV. Dr. George has received a number of honors and recognitions for her most uh, for her work. Most recently, on April 17, 2019, she was awarded the 2019 President's Faculty Research Award at the University of Alabama, Roll Tide. Her holistic approach of her research also garnered her the International Award, the Daniel J. Spirit, Spirit of Renewal Award in 2015. In 2017, she was elected to serve on the International Board of Directors for Sigma Theta Tau, the International Honor Society for Nursing, where she has also held numerous leadership roles, including chair of the International Services Committee, elected member of the Leadership Succession Committee, and vice president of the Epsilon Omega Chapter. Dr. George is a board-certified adult nurse practitioner, and in 2018, she was inducted as a fellow of the American Academy of Nurse Practitioners. Welcome, Dr. George. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I see now why John gets nominated to read these bios. He's amazing and has the voice of a narrator, commentator, sports um, guru, all of the above. Woo Thank you, Dr. George. I'll take any accolades I can get at 830 in the morning. Yes, exactly. Even some punchlines and jokes along the way. So absolutely wonderful. It's my pleasure to be here with all of you this morning. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to connect. This is an amazing group. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm glad you're recording all the connections we could potentially make, all the great things you're doing in the community. Lots of, you know, um, overlap. So lots of work I think we can do in the future together. So happy to be here. I'm going to, it's my pleasure. I've been asked to speak about, you know, healthcare um, during and of course what's going to happen beyond this COVID-19 pandemic we've all been a part of for the past year and counting. So there's no disagreement that this is, you know, as we know, an unprecedented modern public health crisis that's affecting us globally, right? One thing we've also learned over this past year is that patients do experience long-term effects of COVID. 
And we were also seeing that our nurses and other healthcare providers are also experiencing these long-term effects, including you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, burnout, and so on. So I know that we agree that it's vital for us to work together to protect our healthcare providers, right? Because we need them now and we'll need them continuing throughout um, and beyond this pandemic. And so it's also important to note that patient outcomes are also tied to provider outcomes, right? The optimal health of our healthcare providers are tied to how well our patients do. And so it'll be important to support clinical health in this post COVID pandemic era. And I know we're still in COVID, but yet there is there will be a post COVID era on the horizons. And so those of you who know, um, 2020 was declared the year of the nurse and the midwife in honor of the 200th anniversary of the mother of nursing, um, Florence Nightingale. And so it's just interesting that it coincided with the global pandemic that we face. We saw that nurses got a lot of attention on the front lines because they were the ones in the rooms with patients, you know, working alongside, of course, the rest of the healthcare team, doctors, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and so on. Um, and so the highlight and importance of nursing, we really saw in 2020, and of course are continuing to see that in 2021. So not only are nurses delivering care in, I mean, difficult, unreal conditions, but we're also seeing incredible results. You've seen, you know, decreased um, mortality rates, um, comorbidity rates. Of course, we have, you know, a number of vaccinations or vaccines on the market that are, of course, um, keeping our population protected. But even those who perhaps aren't vac weren't vaccinated and had to be hospitalized, we are seeing better outcomes where patients are you know, being discharged and going home with the number of treatments um, that we're able to give them. So collaboration, we've learned, is definitely key. And I think this pandemic really highlighted collaboration on a global scale, right? We had people collaborating across countries, not just within countries or across states, but collaborating across countries um, and was able to get us, you know, quick results in terms of helping to um, curb and curtail this pandemic. So one thing that has been really brought to the forefront um, throughout this pandemic is the role of telehealth. So the pandemic catalyzed implementation of telehealth, right? We were all um, to some degree using telehealth, you know, some um, physician offices were using, you know, video conferencing, especially for uh, mental health counseling, especially for patients in rural areas, but the pandemic really um, catapulted our use of telehealth for primary care, um, for discharge planning, for a number of other things. And early in the pandemic, while providers, you know, were um, mostly working remotely, I think majority have gone back to in-person, um, that helped to increase access to care for patients who were not yet comfortable coming back to, you know, doctor's offices, et cetera. And health systems saw that in the first half of 2020, telehealth visits were eight to 10 times higher than in 2019. So even now as um, you know, offices are seeing patients in person again, they are still offering, a lot of them are still offering the option um, for an in-person versus a telehealth visit, whether it's for um, uh, an initial visit or for a follow-up visit or to discuss lab results, some things that perhaps don't need um, a physical examination. And um, Custer and colleagues found that telehealth visits in one system increased from um, a little bit over 100.4 um, to 801 daily between March and mid-April. So you can see that it really significantly increased the use of telehealth. So we know for sure that telehealth is not going anywhere. We're gonna continue to see telehealth, continue to use um, telehealth in a variety of ways. And so um, as a college of nursing, you know, we also recognize the importance of teaching our nursing students how to conduct telehealth visits and how to use telehealth, um, especially for outpatient settings. And so um, for healthcare providers, in order to you know, address the healthcare needs of the future, healthcare providers also need advanced knowledge and skills. And so our healthcare providers who are already licensed, already you know, finished with their nursing education, they're not necessarily gonna get that from a, a, an actual degree program since they've already completed their um, degree for licensure, but they can get you know, additional telehealth training um, through a number of online courses that are available. Our college is also offering one, but there are also others on the market. 
And so if you can think back to, you know, 30 years ago, when you went to doctor's offices or hospitals, of course, you know, the paper charts and a lot of, um, you know, medical offices, even, you know, as of 2019, were still using, of course, um, paper charts and quickly had to, you know, transition to using electronic medical records, even in outpatient settings. We know hospitals were way ahead of the game in their use of electronic medical records, but even the outpatient visits had to get on board with using electronic medical records so they can readily access and help coordinate care. And so one thing that, um, for example, the Center of Disease Control and Infectious Disease Panels um, here in the US and across um, the globe agree is that there could be future pandemics, right? So we know that you know, COVID-19 um, is one that you know, is a modern day pandemic, but there have been pandemics in the past and we're projected to also see pandemics in the future. Um, and then the role of technology is in, plays an important role um, during pandemics. And of course, COVID-19 highlighted that. Um, but the great news is um, one thing that this pandemic helped to do was increase patients' comfort level in the use of technology, specifically telehealth, and, and have reported um, great patient satisfaction in a number of settings. I think another important thing to consider, and, and someone mentioned or put in the, in the chat about mental health and, and maybe in mental health month. And I think, um, you know, now that our nurses have been on the front lines for uh, over a year now, and many of them are starting to experience the mental toll um, that has been put on them from being on the front lines, whether they're directly providing care to patients with COVID-19 or working in the community, um, with testing or, you know, with vaccination. So there's definitely a need to provide the tools to help them handle um, their mental health symptoms, as well as to prepare nursing students to um, enter the workforce and handle and juggle multiple stressors in the healthcare workforce environment. So of course, um, we know the importance of self-care. And of course, it starts with nurses and other healthcare providers um, trying to engage in you know sort of work-life balance as much as they can but definitely choosing self-care and whatever self-care means for them um, whether it's um, reading running um, but definitely taking time um, to engage in self-care because what i say is it's very difficult to pour from an empty glass right and if your glass is less than half full it's very hard to fill another person's cup and so it's important for us to encourage and support healthcare providers um, in choosing health care and then I already talked about sort of, you know, the importance of um, staying active as one mechanism or intervention um, to help deal with the mental health um, challenges, stress, stressors, um, symptoms that some of our healthcare providers might be experiencing. And of course, we know the importance of deep breathing. There are a number of apps out there that um, nurses can use, um, but we also recognize that um, for many um, healthcare providers, they also might need actual counseling. And so in, in healthcare settings or in organizations, um, one of our uh, members here talked about AFLAC and the benefits they offer, but there are also other um, benefits offered by different agencies in order to, to help um, employees address their mental health needs through counseling of some sort. And there are, of course, a number of um, COVID-19 resources that the American Nursing Association offers. Um, you know, suicide prevention lines, talk spaces. So lots of resources out there that perhaps healthcare providers might not be aware of. So sharing those with, you know, members of your staff so that you know, they can also either use them themselves or share them um, with the constituents or clients that you, you work with. So a number of these, I'm happy to share my slides after this in case you find anything in here um, useful that you might want to share with others. So these are a number of them. So a number of other things, challenges that COVID-19 um, has faced that we will need to consider in the post-COVID era is we already talked about acceleration of telemedicine and the need for um, you know, staff at a number of agencies, no matter what you're doing, whether it's home health, whether it's you know, um, supporting older adults and decision-making, the role that telehealth can play um, in your organization. And you know, we might consider telehealth Oh, the use of, you know, an otoscope from a distance or a digital um, stethoscope to listen to heart rates, but just the use of video conferencing, whether it's for 
health related counseling um, or mental health counseling. Um, that's also considered telehealth, whether you use the fancy um, technology or just video conferencing. And then also the, um, you know, potential or changes in traditional employer based health insurance uh, or some things that folks have been talking about. Um, and some have talked about the reduced use of nursing home and assisted living facilities and more in home health aids, for example, we've seen of seen some of that transition, of course, uh, now as there's more vaccination, we're seeing lower mortality rates in nursing homes. Um, I think we're seeing that normalize more, right? We're seeing more uh, people go back to using trusted um, nursing homes and assisted living facilities or independent living um, facilities. Um, I think one unfortunate thing that we've seen highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic is, um, you know, tensions around racial disparities. And then also what we've seen in terms of um, disparate health outcomes. We've seen higher um, rates of infection and mortality rates and comorbidity rates um, in communities of color affected by COVID-19. And of course, we're also seeing lower uptake of um, COVID-19 vaccination, which then ties back into poorer outcomes. Um, and there's also been discussions about, you know, the impact of this pandemic on drug um, affordability. And so looking to see what, you know, our pharmaceutical industries um, will do in terms of helping to improve drug affordability um, in this um, post-COVID era. And this ties into, you know, where our drugs are produced and manufactured, because one thing we saw with this um, pandemic is a disruption in supply chain demand, if you will, um, and some of the things that were coming from other countries and the difficulties and backlogs and getting um, a number of simple drugs, whether Tylenol or simple things. Um, and I know that, you know, we saw um, some difficulties in even getting furniture. People talked about, you know, the shortage of furniture or the shortage of yeast. I know we all saw, you know, toilet paper shortages at some point during the pandemic and those discussions. So definitely um, this pandemic has opened our eyes um, to the importance of healthcare preparedness, right? And so really emphasizing um, among healthcare teams, their preparedness plans for um, whether it's a health related healthcare preparedness or even a disaster preparedness, which I know in Florida, um, I think do a pretty good job on um, the fact that we experience, you know, um, hurricanes here, for example. And then one other thing that we saw in this pandemic was um, allowing healthcare providers to, uh, to practice to the extent of their um, roles. And you know, open it up for nurse practitioners to be able to do more, nurses, um, physician assistants, um, the role of pharmacists, um, expanding that in, in vaccination and testing. And so, you know, really seeing our healthcare community come together to address this together and allowing them to practice to the you know full extent of their their role and scope. Um, and the other thing I want to talk about is you know, the role of nursing education um, during this pandemic and beyond, because, right, um, nursing education helps prepare um, future nurses. And so as we saw disruptions in healthcare, there were also disruptions, as you can imagine, in nursing education, right? So, you know, clinicals um, were changed for a period of time or closed to nursing students early in the pandemic. Right now, they're, you know, back and reintegrating. But nursing students themselves, of course, um, like the rest of the world, were personally affected, whether they lost family members or experienced financial hardships or job loss um, and their you know, own difficulties in, in continuing the nursing education due to the multiple competing demands as well as the financial hardships that they were uh, placed on them. And then switching their mode of learning to being you know, fully online at one point in time, doing virtual simulations rather than in-person hands-on um, kinds of things. The great news is we're, we're still seeing great um, success rate or pass rates on their nursing licensure examinations. And so we're seeing that the virtual simulation and the nursing um, situations that they're learning in the classroom um, are translating to them being able to think critically, um, you know, in light of the um, lower numbers of clinical hours um, that they were able to receive. So they are on track and doing well to become great future nurses. And so many of our students, even during the pandemic, um, we're working in hospitals on the front lines, whether um, as, and, and I think John talked about his staffing agency, 
working at CNAs um, and or medical assistants or in hospitals, out hospitals, also work, you know, working as um, nurse practitioners or doctoral students are. And so these are definitely proud moments for the nursing profession, but as but for healthcare providers um, on a whole as well. So in some of the things that we did in terms of um, nursing education is of course, making sure that the nursing students were safe and providing you know, um, personal protective equipment and doing that also so that we didn't strain healthcare systems, right? And so what we do, we do of course in partnership with our clinical partners, uh, Memorial Healthcare System being one of them, but it's definitely uh, many others. And so making sure that students were safe so that then um, our patients were safe. And then also providing um, financial assistance. I know some members on the call here talked about the great services that they were um, providing. Um, I think in terms of it was matching um, businesses to um, potential you know, services at no charge. That wasn't one example, but our students and providing them with um, financial aid and helping them navigate expectations versus current reality. So we're co-creating um, our curriculum to meet the needs and demands of our healthcare partners and making sure that, that those align. One thing I think um, has been very helpful for our students, but it can also be helpful to any um, you know, healthcare provider or, or you know, members of this network is um, the use of cognitive flexibility. I think you know, as adults, many of us are able to switch between you know, a number of multitasking things or think about concepts simultaneously, but in light of increasing stress or pressures, that becomes difficult. And so we've found a tool, Heart, heart Math, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Heart Math, um, that uses biofeedback um, to train someone um, to achieve coherence, as we call it. So it helps lower their heart rate, um, lower their blood pressure. So as they're experiencing stress, they're able to you know, regulate very quickly so that, you know, the increased stress that they're experiencing doesn't then, you know, result in a prolonged heart rate over time. And so this is an example of what incoherence look like on the top in red. So, you know, if when a person is experiencing a lot of stress, anxiety, they're experiencing incoherence in terms of their heart rate variability. But when they, once they learn to focus on a positive emotion and sort of it's a you know, very brief meditation, if you will, activity, then we see um, coherence achieved where there's less fluctuation um, in their heart rate, which results in a number of positive outcomes. You can see on the bottom left, benefits of heart math, right? Lower anxiety, less fatigue, um, better sleep, better focus, uh, more calmness, less depression. And so um, we found this to be very helpful um, among our students, but also studies have found it to be helpful in the general population, including healthcare providers. And so, you know, great news for those of you um, who are helping to connect um, nurses um, with future jobs is we do teach our nursing students in the curriculum um, stress management, right, throughout a number of their courses. And we also specifically have a course um, focused on creating healing environments. And this, you know, helps teach um, nursing students um, the importance of self-care, for example, because we know a big thing in healthcare is burnout, that whether it's nurses' experience or physicians or occupational therapists, a lot of burnout, especially now during this COVID um, pandemic, the importance of really teaching our employees um, self-care. So a number of things that we see as best practices is you know, ensuring that employees have telehealth training to some um, degree. And then one thing that I did with our faculty, staff, students, all of our employees is check-ins, right? Regular check-ins with employees to see how they're doing, how they're coping, um, any needs that they have, um, just to sort of um, debrief um, from this ongoing pandemic that they've all been experiencing. And then there's the role of virtual simulation. And simulation, of course, is used in healthcare, but also in other industries. And we recognize the importance of that. And then, you know, um, one of you talked about Zoom fatigue. And so, you know, the, the ability to have virtual meetings, I know we're um, Zoomed out, but even doing that creatively, whether it's using breakout rooms, for example, I love how this group um, uses 
you know, the video, the, the, the oral, but also the chat, right? Really engaging um, information in the chat as well. And so keeping um, folks engaged. And so I talked about um, what we did in, in terms of developing a telehealth course that we launched in March, but we also early in the pandemic launched a contact tracing course because we know that um, Florida in particular needed a lot more contact tracers um, than were available. So we offered a contact tracing course at, at low cost um, that really went in depth into providing an intro to public health, but also um, helping them have the, the requisite knowledge to become contact tracers um, if they were interested in doing so. So that was very beneficial, I think, to um, the South Florida community. And of course, we're continuing business as normal. We'll be um, having our students come back in the fall um, in person. And then of course, continuing to engage with our clinical partners to complete their clinical hours and get ready um, to join the workforce. So we're very happy to what we were able to contribute. And so we recognize that um, you know, nurses are resilient, nursing students are resilient, healthcare providers are resilient, our faculty are. So we've seen um, a new level of resilience, I think, during this pandemic as all of you have, I'm sure, been resilient. And, and the fact that collaboration is key. I love how all of you, um, you know, demonstrate your, how collaborative you are with each other. And I think that's key in order to riding through this pandemic um, at the top. And then just, you know, in summary that telehealth is of course an important resource um, and then simulation for our nursing students, but simulation can also be used for other employees. So lots of lessons learned from this pandemic. So I'll pause here just to be respectful of your time and to help answer any questions or going, to, going in, into anything in more depth. But as you know, we have our main campus on Boca and we, we also have programs in Davie, a part-time um, BSN program for people with a previous degree. We also have um, nurse practitioner students in Harbor Branch, but we have degree programs across all levels, um, including a new, you know, post-master's dermatology certificate. So lots of great things happening at FAU's Christine Elin College of Nursing and just very happy for the opportunity to speak with you briefly. Happy to answer questions. Thank you so much for that. Um, I have so many questions, but and I'm sure everybody else does too, because I think there's just so much to cover. Um, do, who want, who, just, I don't know, raise your hand, speak up, take yourself off mute. Who has a question for Dr. George? It's always nerve wracking to ask the first question I know. Oh, hi. Um, I don't know if you know the answer to this or not, but um, do you see, uh, I, I also uh, do, do some work at Different Like Me where we provide um, counseling services um, and, and we're doing that via telehealth and, that, and Medicare only started uh, approve, uh, pay, uh, reimbursing for that since the pandemic. Do you know if they will, or do you see that as a trend in the future? Do you see that continuing? Um, and personally, I do. So I've been in a telehealth space for uh, many years now, uh, almost a decade. And I remember, you know, we were having discussions about parity. So whether a telehealth visit would get the same reimbursement as an in-person visit. So that was a big thing because, you know, insurers were, have, they had different reimbursement rates. And, and you're correct. So the pandemic has um, you know, catalyze the progress we're making in insurances signing on board um, to reimbursing. And, and that has significantly increased, as you said, during this pandemic, but, I, but there are discussions, of course, to continue, and I don't know what to what level, um, but reimbursing for telehealth visits, because there is research that supports, you know, the same outcomes in terms of telehealth visits. And, and I know for different sectors, different kinds of um, visits, whether it's, um, you know, a primary care outpatient visit or it's a counseling visit. I know there's usually a parity in counseling visits. So that was even previously established before the, you know, physical primary care kinds of visits. So I imagine, I imagine that many, a lot of this will continue, but for some sectors of the healthcare industry, you know, more lobbying, if you will, might be needed. 
So Thank definitely you. advocacy groups will be key in, in getting the reimbursement rates that we desire to continue. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm on mute. Any, any other questions? For, I can't believe there could be only one question for Dr. George, because there's so much. Pat, go ahead. Hi, good morning. I just wanted to say that thank you so much for the cooperation and coordination that we have with Florida Atlantic University for not only our nurses, students, and our internships that take place, but also for the opportunity for some of our staff members, including our former Dr. Hawk, who uh, was teaching some classes there as well. So thank you for that relationship that we have had over many years. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you very much. We appreciate our partnership with TrustBridge for sure. Well, I'm going to ask my question because I've been chomping at the bit. I want to know as a patient because I'm not in the medical space like everybody else is. So obviously, I've noticed that you know nurses do a ton. You hardly ever see the doctor anymore. You know your nurses can write a prescription for you. They do everything for you. But I'm wondering with the pandemic, have you seen an uptick or a downtick, or is it too early to tell how many people are actually going to nursing school now? People just looked at this pandemic and said, forget it. Like there's already so much nurses are doing. I, I'm not signing up for this. I'm gonna do something else. Um, that would be one question. It, it's got a, I've got a couple multiple things because it's like all the things you've always wanted to ask as a patient. Um, so there's the nursing factor, and then what about um, the, the PA, you know, now it's like the doctor, so is there more of an uptick for, to be a PA, and has that sort of left nursing behind, or are nursing and PAs kind of melding, that's what I've always wanted to know, how does that affect, you know, the nursing industry, and then my third part, sorry, three parts, you all had your chances, I hear all of these things about, um, nurse traveling nurses like they're offering so so much money to traveling nurses how does that have you seen an effect on that locally or what you know how does that work so that's everything i've always wanted to ask i just asked awesome. <laughs> great yeah can't fault you for that absolutely love your questions so the first question um was about whether there's an uptake of you know people interested in nurses or is like, they're like oh no you know running the other way and I think it surprised many of us in nursing education thinking that you know because remember nurses were dying at the beginning of the pandemic right we saw nurses dying in New York across the globe um, but at at our institution we've seen an uptick of people interested I think our applications have almost doubled they've increased throughout the pandemic we were getting emails oh i'm seeing what's happening you know i feel called to nursing i'd love to be a part and so we saw an increase in in people being interested in nursing and so and of course we also saw increases in existing nurses who were interested in doing more and wanted to become nurse practitioners or further their degree their degree so definitely an an, an uptake i think since there's such a shortage of healthcare providers, um, it doesn't affect physician assistant versus nurses, right? So PAs or physician assistants do similar work to nurse practitioners, right? They can, both sets of individuals um, can prescribe, can do advanced assessments, can order tests, um, labs, et cetera. Um, so they're, you know, they're very similar. Um, it's just that a nurse has her own nurse practitioner license, whereas a phys physician assistant works, you know, directly under um, a physician's license, right? It's just a slightly different model. Um, but yeah, I don't think either has affected the other. Um, and some of the healthcare partners that we have, hospitals, um, continue to have a lot of vacancies in South Florida. And I think that's true for other parts of the country as well, because lots of nurses have decided to become travel nurses, right? You could make, in some instances, 10,000 per month, or in, in some cases, 10,000, I mean, even sooner than that, right? There were huge um, pays, $200 an hour. I mean, you saw the whole gamut of what, you know, places were offering, especially those that were hot spots in the pandemic, right? Initially in Washington State and definitely in New York. So people were 
travel nurses were moving, you know, to, to all the hotspots. And, but what we're seeing now is um, those nurses are returning, right? So even here in South Florida, a lot of the healthcare um, institutions, the hospitals, a lot of their nurses left to go become travel nurses, but they're now coming back and they're welcoming, welcoming them back, right? They recognize that, you know, some nurses saw the opportunity to help, to earn more, to pay off their student loans. And they're welcome, welcoming them back because we, of course, we need them. So many hospitals are welcoming their nurses back. Um, and so that they can also, you know, um, integrate back into their healthcare systems that they already know they can help train the new nurses. So I don't think there's any um, hard feelings, if you will. Um, but yeah, they're welcoming them back. I think I answered all your questions. Travel nursing, uh, PA, and whether there's an increase in people interested in nursing. Sorry, it's like sitting oh. next to a pilot on an airplane, you know, it's like everything you yeah. always wanted to ask. No worries, absolutely. And I'm more of the patient side. Everyone here is, you know, the medical side. So I'm super curious about everything. All right, so now that I've asked my four million questions, who else has a question for Dr. So, I mean, that's all great news for us living in South Florida that we have lots of people interested in nursing. So definitely a good sign. I, um, I just wanted to add a quick comment, um, especially related to the travel nursing. It's my understanding that several hospitals had to put in place a clause that said that the nurse that's been on staff, you know, and, and an active employee can't resign their position and then go to work at a trap for a travel company and return to their actual you know hospital that they've been an employee at so i think there were some clauses that were put in because nurses were getting very savvy and thought well why am i going to work next to somebody who's earning so much more than i am and they're just here temporarily when i am a loyal employee so a lot of them left but a lot of them were also surprised to find out that they had to go to a different local facility in order to be able to do the travel nursing and their position at the hospital that maybe they've worked at for a number of years may not be there when they return. Right, right. And a hush comes across the room. Um, Dr. George, thank you so much for this wonderful uh, presentation that you gave us today. Does anyone else have any questions? And then we'll go to announcements. Hello? Oh, it looks like Roz has a question. She has her hands up. Oh, hey, Roz. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. Do we have any announcements today? Wait, like everybody's quiet this morning. Then the coffee, what? I will say that the uh, Palm Beach Medical Society is going to be having its Heroes of Medicine Award. Uh, if anyone like any of the information about that, that is going to be an online presentation. Um, I was lucky enough this year to be the chair of that event along with Dr. Martha Rodriguez from MMR. Um, it is a wonderful event that benefits the Palm Beach Medical Society and everything that they do um, with their project access to reach out to underserved communities to provide healthcare to them. So please uh, take a moment and register for that event uh, and join us on the Zoom event coming up uh, next week. Actually this week, Thursday. John, I just also wanted to say that so I am we are looking to August to have our first in-person meeting. Um, I don't know where, so it'll be a surprise for everybody. Uh, I, I really wanted to thank Dr. George again. This was you know, incredible. And we at the Chamber have such a great partnership with FAU and we're so grateful for that. And you know, I'm always, I've lived here in South Florida for a long time. And I don't know what it is, but working at the Chamber and meeting the people that I get to meet, I'm so amazed at the resources and the talent that we have here in our community. I mean, we are so lucky to have someone like Dr. George, who's just so accomplished in so many, you know, different ways. So I cannot thank you enough for speaking today. And hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll put you on the sham list and maybe we'll see you in person one of these days, you know, at, at Chan. But I just wanted to let everyone know that we are working on we are, we are shooting for August because 
as you know, we have no um, Shan in July. So we'll have a Shan in June and no Shan in July. And hopefully we will see everybody in person in August. So that's all I wanted to add. Anybody else? I know Barbara likes to close with a quote. Wow, we're like efficient this morning. It's crazy. Yes. Well, uh, if there's no other special announcements or activities or anything going on, remember to connect with everybody on LinkedIn. Um, and next month, when you get the invitation, forward it to somebody else in healthcare, somebody that you've met along the way. Invite them to this meeting so we can have a really strong turnout in August when we actually meet back in person. So let's get the momentum rolling so when you get that email, think to yourself, who do I know in healthcare that hasn't been attending the Shan meeting in a while uh, due to a scheduling conflict or maybe somebody new that you've met along the way. So thank you, Dr. George. I look forward to receiving the um, slides because I do wanna share those resources with TrustBridge and let them know some of the resources that are available to nurses in the event that we don't have some of the same information that you've provided. I can't thank you enough for such a fabulous presentation with lots of great information. So it's been great and go owls. <laughs> and um, I always like to close with a quote. So this one is ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. And that's by Samuel Beckett. Awesome. Thank you for attending. I know you guys all have lots of opportunities. I appreciate the support. We are coming up into our, I think, 13th year uh, with Shan. This October would be our, I believe, 12th or 13th anniversary. So it's uh, a privilege to spend the morning with you guys uh, once a month. So very much appreciated. Thanks so much, Barbara. And I'll always, I always say to our key sponsors, I'm sorry that they weren't able to join us, but we're so lucky to have our partnership with Memorial. And if anyone needs any information, give me a day or two because I do always send out, you know, the contact information and I will send out um, the YouTube link, which I pretty much did last month, I think. So sometimes it takes us a little while to download that. So you have to give me the day or two. But thank you, uh, everyone. And this was a great group and just so much good information. Becky, are you raising your hand? I, I can't, you're on mute. Sorry. No, I was just waving goodbye. Oh, okay, I didn't know, didn't know if I missed anybody. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, so we will see everybody next month and we'll get geared toward August. Bye, everyone. Take care. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.